Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Erhan Aslanoğlu. Thank you also uh, for inviting me to this beautiful, wonderful conference. Of course, I would have loved to be there in person as I am, my hometown is Istanbul. So uh, any kind of excuse and opportunity to visit uh, Turkey and my hometown, of course, would be wonderful. But in the, um, in the duration of this pandemic, at least we can do what we can. And I will, I'm very happy to share uh, some of my <clears throat> research and, and, and um, opinions about the sustainable tourism development and the role of technology in it. So with your permission, I would like to uh, share my screen. So hopefully you can see my PowerPoint presentation here. Yes, um, yes we can see. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And I have uh, prepared, this is about 30 minutes, hopefully, and then we'll have some, hopefully, time for some questions and answers. Uh, I'm joining you today from uh, Sarasota, Florida, uh, beautiful Florida. Just like you said, there is a lot of great uh, destinations, countries in many region, including Turkey. Uh, but Florida is also a very good um, tourism destination. So today, the impact of technology on sustainable tourism development, speaking of sustainable tourism, I would like to just do a one minute commercial of the M3 Center where I am serving as the director for M3 Center for Hospitality Technology and Innovation. In the center, we produce research, we host visiting scholars. Uh, we also publish open access journals, the ones that you see on the screen and also open access books. Again, being sustainable, all of our open access journals and books are e-copies and they are 100% open access again, thanks to M3 Center and also to University of South Florida Library. So for those of you who are interested, these journals, Journal of Global Business Insight, Journal of Global Education and Research and our newest journal, Journal of Global Hospitality and Tourism, please go to m3center.org and click on journals. So um, the topic, sustainability, IT and tourism industry, how we are going to combine them together. Let me just tell you that M3 Center, also one of the things that we have, we um, organize think tanks around the world. So, and like we just did one in 2018, October in Vietnam as part of a Glow Search conference. And we had another one in 2018, November in New York. And we also had one in Cyprus in February 2019. Um, so from these think tanks and also a global Delphi uh, study, we have done among all tourism academics and also travelers around the world that we have asked them about the trends in hospitality and tourism. This is just a screenshot that you see here is from our study. So people had open-ended questions, then our researchers have categorized them as uh, handling with their qualitative data. And we have come up with all these different um, items, topics, issues, whatever. And we came up with this list. And this list that you see here was done in 2019, number one trend, and this is again, global survey was sustainable tourism. Number two was technology. Again, hence this presentation, sustainable tourism and technology. And we're gonna talk in a second how we can marry them. But just for the list goes, experience tourism was number three, innovation, security and safety, personalization, artificial intelligence and robots, sharing economy, over tourism and alternative tourism. Over tourism, Maybe some of you uh, may be familiar with this term was, was it was actually created to reflect that too many people visiting a destination, therefore making it not sustainable and also even damaging the environment as well. So, um, and in 2020, now because of the coronavirus and the pandemic around the world is gone, it become over tourism became no tourism or little tourism. And number nine became alternative tourism and number 10 became wellness tourism. Again, this is all the trends that people have actually uh, created. So why 
this sustainability is so important in the tourism because of simple reason that world population, as you all know, is increasing. This is as of yesterday, uh, current world population meter, as you can see that this is just increasing every single second that we are talking, uh, we are adding more humans on earth. So as of today is 7.8 billion people live in the world. And when you look at the predictions by 2050, that we're gonna have uh, 9.3 billion people on earth. What does that mean? That means that just simply there is more people on earth, more people, more tourism. Of course, people are social animals, even though right now the tourism industry has been uh, very uh, significantly affected negatively because of the coronavirus, world travel really halted uh, and the numbers of tourists are going to decrease um, significantly this year. But we all know that the minute that this pandemic is over, the travel is going to recover as it happened many, many times in the history before. This is a busy slide, but I just want you to look at only the top portion here. This numbers came from uh, United Nations World Tourism Organization, which is the organization that keeps the statistics for international tourists. And international tourists is defined as the tourist that goes from one country to another for touristic purposes. When you look at here in 1990, there were 435 million people that traveled from one country to another. And if you look at here, uh, the, the distribution of those 435 million tourists, how among the advanced economies versus emerging economies, one third was from emerging economies and two third were from advanced economies. When you come to 2015 or even to, to up to 2019, you see that this, did, of course, the numbers increased significantly. And you can see here that 2014 was the first year there were more than 1 billion uh, people actually had uh, visited from one country to another. Um, and of course, in 2020, now we are going to go down 1 billion people. But what I'm trying to say is that there is all these people that come and uh, visit for uh, countries, destinations, attractions, etc. So now when you look at the uh, UNESCO report, United Nations Environment Program, and the Union of Concerned Scientists, major heritage science uh, sites are at risk due to mass tourism and global warming. This is an indication that happened before you see the picture on actually the screen that is the great world in China. Look at this. This is, of course, before the pandemic. Right now, the picture looks very different due to uh, all known reasons, but please look at this and tell me how you think that this tourism can be sustainable from all different uh, perspectives, uh, from the um, environmental perspective, ecological perspective, even economical perspective, it is, um, and China, look at this in time, China wants people to st stop stealing Great Wall bricks because the people who visit here for souvenir reasons that they try to take those bricks and of course damaging them. There's many, many different examples, the same thing that I can give you. As a matter of fact, this whole hour, we can just talk about how people are destroying these sites and tourism in, in different countries. This is what um, Disney Resort before the pandemic so the pandemic, you can see the, the impact. Of course, this was when Disney was closed. Now they are open in America, even though Corona status is not sold 100%. That, but of course, the admission is much less than what it needs to be. Look at this. This is a game before pandemic. Venice uh, were one of the destinations that really had a lot of problems with, um, with tourist actually destruction, I should say. Um, they were... Um, very, very unhappy, the, the locals in Venice. But from there, actually, we come to ecology versus economy. Now, you know, all around the world, uh, politicians are trying to sometimes even downplay uh, coronavirus, like in America, for example, for the cost of economy. So 
Look at this video that I'm going to show you a short clip, and I hope that you'll be able to hear this. This is from uh, CBS actually this morning that in Venice, the picture that I've shown you earlier that there were sick of tourists and they were trying to send them back. Now, look what happened here. Italy was Europe's first epicenter for the coronavirus outbreak, but now it's starting to reopen. Venice, one of the world's most famous cities, has suffered without its usual tourists, but it's enjoyed an unintended benefit. Chris Lidstead traveled to the city of water to see how nature was suddenly flourishing. Good morning. Now, as hard as the lockdown has been on all of us, there's one silver lining no one can deny. Staying at home has been largely good for the environment. And here in Venice, this lagoon city has returned to its pre-industrial tranquility. more than any other city under lockdown has gone from one extreme to the other. The Rialto Bridge, the Grand Canal, even St. Mark's Square deserted. Streets and canals usually awash with tourists, now so still, nature is filling the void, says ecologist Monica Sugovini. Is it raining? Oh my God. Yeah, there he is under the rope. Oh my gosh, the baby. Nearby, an octopus beneath a dock Schools of fish and underwater life, and jellyfish like the one you spotted. Hardly any boat to scare them away or to churn up cloudy sediment. Transformation so dramatic, the European Space Agency snapped these satellite images taken one year apart. Conspicuously absent, cruise ships. Last year, more. So you can see here that the point that we are trying to make, of course, this pandemic has shown us that how sustainability is so important in tourism. Look, this is a cruise ship before the pandemic again in Venice that people, 4,000 people, they had 10 cruise ships every day coming to that city, of course, having creating a huge problem now that they are missing though. If uh, we watch this clip on CBS, you would have seen the Venice mayor is uh, encouraging visitors to come back because you know, tourism is, even though it's very, very um, important in terms of sustainability, but sustainable tourism is also very important for economy all around the world. 10% of GDP is in tourism uh, sector and uh, many, many countries in MENA regions and of course uh, around the world is tourism creates a lot of jobs, but there is a way to do it. This is the ecosystem of all different industries, what we call is smart society. So not just in tourism, but in governance, in environmental quality, agriculture, smart agriculture, waste and recycling, community, health and well-being, education, in all of these areas that we are, uh, be, we should be able to do it a uh, smart city in such a way uh, that is. And part of this big ecosystem of smart ecosystem is smart tourism. Across the board in tourism, as you see, tourist attractions, travel agents, restaurant, we are trying to achieve sustainability with the help of technology. Of course, technology help other things as well, but I would like to define very quickly what I define as technology. And again, this is not from any place. This is my own um, uh, definition of technology and smart. In a second, I will also explain smart as well, but this is technology doesn't have to be a high uh, expensive cost uh, computer system, etc. Technology is defined as any skill, tool, process, or way of doing anything better, faster, more efficient, cheaper, more sustainable. So you can just smart. On the other hand, is uh, connected to technology, is connected technologies that make decisions or take actions without manual input that creates more efficient, faster, cheaper process. Again, smart is the connectivity issue. It makes it, of course, that is sustainable. Tourism is very important part of the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, as you have probably seen many, many references to this in this conference. So smart city is creating sustainable tourism development. Let's just see how this happens. And 
One of the technologies that makes this happen is called Internet of Things. That's the smart that I have defined to you. Actually, if you see, look at the definition. Let's just watch this video for 30 seconds. Again, this was the um, a little bit older video, but you can see that this actually happened, what, what they were um, predicting before. And now, you know, smart technologies, connected technologies or Internet of Things, different people call it different, came into even our houses. Now, if you go to, a, to buy a refrigerator nowadays that you can see that smart fridge that actually scans what you have inside your fridge based on the RFID codes or even weight scans. And then when your, let's say milk goes down and it notifies uh, you that your milk is going down or whatever that might be. And then if you even connect that your uh, refrigerator to your online ordering system that you may even order automatically for you. So that is one level of, this is actually the picture that you see here is the kitchen of the home of the future actually. This was from Microsoft campus that I visited believe it or not, 15 years ago, Bill Gates there created this home of the future 15 years ago that actually had this technology that today is becoming slowly mainstream that detects what you have in your kitchen based on the RFID codes and then suggests you some recipes that you can make at home and reflect that on your countertop to be able to do it. So take that technology, smart technology into your cities to be able to create sustainable tourism, not only just for the uh, tourists, but also for the people that are uh, visiting your city. For example, in this particular uh, street light, they don't only light the streets and create security, but also gives you traffic information, parking availability, surveillance for security purposes, and weather quality. It sucks the air and then uh, reports on the weather quality. So when you create this uh, Internet of Things or smart technologies, actually, you'll be able to achieve many different things. Like this, several cities in the world already start implementing these street lights and other um, uh, smart city applications. For example, if based on if you were to have this technology now with an app that if you're looking for a parking place that you would actually save time and and of course save energy and hence increase that sustainability there. We'll be able to go there and you know the life quality for handicapped people. For example, in this uh, example that you see that this person on a wheelchair has a connected device, smart device that actually communicates with the traffic light and then allows him or her to be able to enough time to cross the street. So that's another example of smart city. So, but at the end of the day, it, actually the, the topic of this presentation is sustainability and tourism and technology. So let's just talk about that. So the cities and also the golf courses in hospitality and tourism, as you know, golf courses play a huge role. And then some of you, any of you who may be in uh, going to a golf course, you would know that it has a lot of green areas. Similarly, cities also have a lot of green areas, which they would like to water on a regular basis. Now these weather sensors that is actually installed in, for example, a golf course that you see in this example, they also measure the humidity in the earth and also communicate with the weather systems to be able to adjust the level of watering. Therefore saves about 40 to 50% water, increasing the sustainability. Air conditioning. I am sure that you all know it's something that now we live without, we cannot live without actually, especially in hot areas such as Florida, uh, that 12 months in a, in a year that you need uh, air conditioning. This is split clima. Many of you may have this in our homes or workplaces, very inefficient from the energy perspective. So what did the scientists have done actually 
get uh, inspiration from this picture. Actually, this is the underground city in Cappadocia area in Turkey. That if you have visited this, this underground city, which I did, and one thing that you will notice that as you go uh, minus one, minus two, minus three, four, five, six, seven, that it gets colder and colder. You know, before we had refrigerators, our ancestors, maybe even grandmothers uh, and fathers have actually utilized uh, earth, just digging it into earth and putting the meat or milk, things that are perishable uh, there to be able to keep them cold. Same idea applied into air conditioning in the form of a chiller plant. These water tanks are um, uh, buried under the earth, 30, 40, 50 meter, where this tank has the water uh, naturally keep it cold. And then this uh, system actually pushes the water from, uh, the, from the water pipes. And then another system sucks the hot air from the buildings and make them go through these cold pipes that has the cold water, which was cooled by the way, without any additional um, energy. And then hence, of course, saves a lot of a lot of energy. Very, very efficient. This is used in hotels, resorts, uh, theme parks, you name it, any place. Of course, uh, also industrial buildings as well. This is one example from our university actually here uses that one. Uh, water and electricity meters are all electronic now, digital, so people don't need to go there. So you'll be able to control uh, better. So for example, from the sustainability perspective, technology again helps tourist destinations and also the cities for their water reserves and also the beaches that people enjoy. The picture that you see here is a robotic eel actually that tests the water, randomly takes the water on a 24 hour basis and then tests this automatically and then also report that to <clears throat> authorities or citizens uh, of a city, just like you see in this video. You can see that the, uh, the robotic eel is, this is a lake, for example, and actually getting the water, and you'll see in a second in the video, uh, it is sucking the water in random places and analyzing just like you see on here and goes there. More and more technologies are being developed as we speak. This, this one is from Dubai. This one not only tests the water quality, but also clean the debris and it works with solar energy. So you can see in this in this video um, here, and of course, there's a lot of plastic that is being thrown into our water uh, waters uh, by residents and tourists alike. And something needs to be done about it. Again, a lot of people are uh, thinking about that. City is also implementing smart traffic lights, which is actually changing the duration of the green versus red light, depending upon the traffic, the flow, to be able to keep the traffic as uh, fluid as possible. And here, this is actually, a, looks like a joke, but in China, they have uh, realized that the students in the dormitories use a lot of water for uh, not good reasons. So this uh, Chinese university actually develop an app that you go and scan, the students go and scan before they take shower and it's timed. Uh, so three minutes or five minutes, whatever, that the students actually have to be very efficient and trying to save a lot of water. So there is a lot of technologies, good or bad, are coming into one of them also in our transportation system. Some of you may have been uh, flying with Dreamliner uh, 787. It's the world's first plastic plane, $120 million, as opposed to its competitor before, $380 million. Of course, it's made of plastic, a different kind of plastic, much lighter, therefore, hence the uh, airplane uh, tickets have been uh, very, very, um, get cheaper over the last years. But it is interesting that even though the planes are becoming more sustainable, uh, consumes less energy, it makes it cheaper to fly, hence more people are flying. So the balance between sustainability here needs to be researched. Um, Elon Musk is talking about, uh, this is an idea stage right now to be able to actually throw a rocket into the space where you can travel from any place on earth to any other place on earth less than uh, half an hour. Like this, you see in this uh, video, for example, New York to London, normally six, seven hours, 
but you can, with this technology, fly in 29 minutes. When this happens, of course, right now, uh, you can see that, that it is uh, possible to be able to fly to many, many different. And of course, right now, it's a crazy idea. A lot of people may not believe, but uh, the people who know Elon Musk, uh, they know that he really can do things. Project Wahana started in 2015 by Airbus, and this is um, automated autonomous self-flying air taxis. When this actually, I just went to Airbus um, website this morning, and I have seen that they have actually tested the system. It was the idea prototype in 2015. Now you see, I don't know if you can see in this video, but this is Wahana actually. That's the electric self uh, operating uh, flying car uh, that is going to probably in the next 20 uh, years. The impact of this on our regular transportation is yet to be seen, but flying cars are being actually prototyped in this example. You're gonna see that we are going to have cars like this, just like any other cars, but we are gonna go to, instead of an airport, we're gonna go to what they call carport, just like you will see now. When you come to a carport, you will use the drone technology and you'll be able to fly. Hyperloop was an idea gained from Elon Musk, but now it become is becoming a reality. Is the train that actually works as the capsule that sucks the air, therefore achieving about 1,000 km per hour speeds, which is the equal to airline speed. So imagine that you're going with a train uh, in the airline speed. So all of these things are really creating new opportunities for tourism, of course, for transportation for everybody, but yet the impact of these on sustainability yet to be seen, while it's going to be more efficient, faster, cheaper to travel, how that's going to impact the number of people going from one place to another after the pandemic is done is yet to be seen. Look at this, trains that go on virtual railways, uh, the places that's difficult to actually build railways, but you can, uh, this, this company in China tested that. You can see even it is minus 20 Celsius um, in China in some regions. But look, this train actually can move in this virtual uh, tracks, which is again going to open up a lot of different. And it's all electric, autonomous cars. Um, this is becoming reality right now. I don't know if any of you is driving a Tesla or any other that is actually becoming more and more autonomous but this is actually going to bring soon a new concept as you see in this picture that many people own their cars which is actually adding to do a uh, sustainable problem in a negative way but in the future when we are going to have all autonomous cars that it is likely that we will not probably own a car instead we'll be able to be part of a system where shared cars and we will be able to actually go and maybe um, don't even buy a car, just subscribe to a car system. Whenever we need transportation, we'll be able to call one of these autonomous cars and come and pick us up and do other things. That Again, another research topic here. This is a research conference. Many, many different areas of research, not just for tourism scholars, but also other mainstream scholars. What you see here in this picture is from a hotel. One hotel is actually giving their guests an option for green options, right? So you'll be able to um, turn on and off your lights when you are in the room or when you're outside of the room and also do not disturb here. And of course the, the, the temperature. So this system gives you the choice to be able to adjust the temperature inside the hotel room when you are not in the hotel room. So this way, when you are not occupying the room, the energy system will cut it down. That saves about 40% energy. Um, this is becoming more and more. As you see, this is the Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. Today, jokingly, people actually add two more levels to it. 
they say Wi-Fi and battery life becoming as part of this becomes so important. Why did I just bring this up? Because now technology is supporting that particular need and everybody is using smartphones and tablets, etc. Now you are seeing in every places in hotels, restaurants, or airports or any other, even some of our homes are installing devices that actually meet this need. You can see more and more example, but that's uh, likely to change in the next 10, 20 years because of wireless electricity is coming into our world. In the next 10 years, we will be losing our cables to charge our devices, especially our low voltage devices, such as cell phones and laptops, etc. And this is going to become more and more. As you can see in this video, this wireless electricity can be transmitted with Wi-Fi signals. Again, I'm not going to go into de too depth, but here's one another amazing, and I'm almost done here. I know uh, my time. Solar panels here, as you know, solar panels were black, are black, and they are usually ugly looking on the top of the buildings or in the Greenlands. But this company in Israel actually created the first solar powering glass. So it's crystal clear. You can see outside just like regular glass, but yet it's generating power. This is going to be utilized in many, many different hotels and or maybe even regular business uh, buildings and homes alike. Solar Freeway is a test drive in Jinan in China, as you can see here. This is one attempt to be able to actually power the cars that go in on this uh, highway. We will yet to see if this is going to contain or not because like companies like Tesla is creating more and more powerful uh, batteries or companies, innovative companies. This is Gogoro uh, from Taiwan. Actually, I was there last year and look at this motorcycle. It is a motorcycle where you use a recyclable battery. So you don't have to charge. You go to a gas station, just like instead of buying a gas, actually you are using this technology, take your old batteries, use batteries, plug them in into this station get a two new charge batteries. Therefore, you don't even need to charge your uh, device. This is in Taiwan. You will be able to see, I'm gonna show you very quickly how this actually works. I just fast drive, fast forward the video. See, this is actually um, one of my students who are using this motorcycle. He pushes the button there and the, the, the seat uh, opens. And here we go. He just takes this used batteries this way, there is no fear of being without any power. So it's about seven kilogram here. As you can see he's going to put that in to do um, the station behind, and then you will be able to see it in ten seconds, hopefully. Here we go. He places them, and then I'm placing the other one, and then. The machine, this station is going to give me two new ones after I press the button. So in conclusion, this is my last slide. What I would like to say that sustainability in tourism is very important all around the world. Everybody is trying to achieve this and it is possible. We have seen many great examples of destinations that created sustainable solutions for people. Technology adds to the sustainability problem sometimes in a negative way. All of these devices uh, require more green gas, um, you know, flying more, making making it cheaper, but pe more people fly. And hence it is uh, having a negative impact. But the point that I'm trying to make here that there are a lot of technological developments that may have positive impact in sustainable, sustainability in general, but sustainable tourism in particular as well. So technology is here to stay. That my challenge to all researchers is to be able to look at in this presentation that we have actually seen um, many different research um, ideas here that we need to tackle these issues one at a time and try to be able to come up with great solutions that will help to the sustainability of this beautiful earth. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Chobanoğlu, for this excellent presentation, inspiring and stimulating pre presentation. That was excellent. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, maybe I there may be some questions on chat. I I will.